Hello, everyone. It's Matt Moshe. Welcome back to Product for Product. Thanks for tuning in this week. We are excited to have Avanon Zelenko on the show to discuss his work in product management, the tools he's using, and general insights into how PMs can perform better in their roles. So welcome to the show, Avanon. Thanks for joining us. Let's take a sec to introduce yourself. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here, uh, Matt and Moshe. Uh, yeah, so my name's uh, Avinam. You can call me Avi. Uh, that's what a lot of people call me. Yeah, I'm currently a PM at LinkedIn. I've been there for about a year and three months, um, give or take. I joined during COVID, so that's been an interesting experience as well. Uh, before that, I was at Atlassian uh, for about three years, spent most of my time working on Confluence Cloud. Uh, I was the lead PM for um, basically introducing a brand new editor. Um, and replacing the old one, which was an experience within itself, and spent a little bit of time when I joined on HipChat, but that was uh, something Atlassian uh, exited at one point, exiting basically the messaging or like uh, instant communication space. And yeah, I've been a PM for about, I'd say probably a little over 10 years. I've done e-commerce, I've done enterprise analytics, I've done enterprise chat, I've done like I've said, collaboration, now consumer, and I've been at all kinds of sizes of companies. LinkedIn has been the biggest, but I've been at medium-sized companies. Uh, I've been at startups with like less than 40 people where I was the first PM. So it's been a fun ride. Uh, hey, uh, Vinam and uh, hey, Matt. Nice having you on the show, Vinam. Uh, really glad to, to have you. And I, I think that I used that new editor for Confluence uh, for a short time while I was still using it. So I guess now I know who to blame for that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. It's, it's, one re- it's a one-to-one relationship. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> and, and I actually, I also used HipChat before Sna- um, uh, what to call it? Uh, Slack. Um, Slack was uh, older age, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I, I don't remember if it was a good product or not, but uh, I, I didn't even know that um, Atlassian are not using it anymore. Or they're not, it's not their product anymore. Yeah, yeah. It was actually a very inspiring um, business decision. We're happy to talk about it. To, to actually get off that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, maybe we'll get to that. You know, the, the focus of our podcast is products and products that uh, product managers are using. Uh, we, we've heard a lot of uh, actually great feedback from people that it's something that usually um, other podcasts are not talking about. Uh, and we always like to look at the, uh, twist or spin or point of view of different product managers and, and the tools that you're, they're using. And one of the things that really intrigued me when I talked with you, when we met, was about uh, how the culture of companies where you worked influenced the tools that you they're using and, and then vice versa, how the tools they're using influence the culture. With your experience with Atlassian and LinkedIn, but also with the other companies that you mentioned you worked before there, uh, it will be really cool to hear, uh, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean that the culture of an organization uh, influence the tools and the tools influence the culture? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think one of the things or observations that I've noticed, um, so I've been at five companies, I think, up till now, including LinkedIn, is the cycle or the magnitude of which you see the impact of the culture on the products and the products on the culture. I think it's a pretty like fortunate place to be where a lot of PMs want to be. Um, it's what I kind of call is when you get to be a product manager that's behind the curtains. So essentially it's like you're in the very lucky place where you get to build products for people like yourself. Um, and in my case, you know, like in a lot of product managers case, like going to Atlassian, um, you literally feel that you're giving back to the community that you come from because you spend so much time using their tools and uh, giving feedback and you become a power user. So being on behind the curtain side, um, it amplifies that. And at LinkedIn, for me personally, I'm very active on LinkedIn. It's probably the only social media I use and somehow found myself creating a lot of content there. So same thing, like being a PM that works on the feed is like as behind the curtain as it gets, is literally building stuff for people like myself, which is Again, it really brings out this sense of how the culture and the tools that are built um, actually impact each other. And I think one of the key aspects there, which I felt uh, by far more at Atlassian and at LinkedIn than other companies. um, So the other three companies I worked at, 
I never was the customer of the product. Maybe sometimes like chat, maybe sometimes I use chat on a website. Analytics for a little bit, I was the customer, but it wasn't as big of a part of my day. And um, when I worked in e-commerce, like I was never the customer, but I uh, spent three years there nonetheless. But all of a sudden, when you come to these places like Atlassian and LinkedIn, I think the thing that automatically catches your eye is like you live in this uh, meta state where you're always dog fooding the product for people like yourself and you're using the products that you're actually building for others, but you're using them as well. So you're like in this inception kind of moment and you're kind of in this cycle that keeps on going back and forth. And I think generally, like I would recommend if any product manager can like find a product like that, whether whatever it may be, uh, it's a pretty unique experience because on one hand, it's equally exciting because you're very passionate about it. But at the same time, um, a bit unrelated to what we're talking about, it really helps you with uh, facing your biases and making sure that you don't incorporate them into how you build stuff uh, mm -hmm. because it's very, very tempting. And just to circle back really quickly on this whole notion of how like the culture of a company impacts the tools that are built and how those like come back. I'll give you like an anecdote. So when you join Atlassian, the core values, they have five core values. I'm going to try to remember them all, which is open company, no bullshit. Don't fuck the customer. Build with heart and balance. Play as a team and be the change you seek. Exactly in that language? Yes. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and the first two are probably <laughs> quoted and used the most. And, <laughs> and people get commended for living up to them and people get called out in public forums for not living up to them, to mm -hmm. hold them to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, first of all, because the language is in your face. It's not trying to beat around the bush. It gets to like, uh, it, it strikes a, a nerve. Mm -hmm. um, but what's really interesting is you see that it's a culture where, you know, I think like every company where a lot of people work, there there's values, they're up on the walls. And it's pretty rare to see companies that were like the values are, really something that's in the language and even in documentation and even in how teams get called out for doing great work or examples where we can do better it's really ingrained in everything that's done and there's even like a values interview and you have to be certified to like be able to do a values interview it really means a lot and you feel it it's 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 palpable you can reach out and touch it and as soon as you join the thing that empowers this culture is the fact that everybody is using Confluence um, like you've never seen before. Essentially, this open company, no bullshit thing, um, Confluence was built with this uh, product philosophy of being an open by default product, which when you think about it is not trivial. It actually creates a lot of friction to think about how to solve that problem as a product manager because it doesn't fit any mental model that any working uh, knowledge worker has today. So I'll give you an example. Think about like any product that you use to collaborate, almost anyone in your professional setting is private by default. If you go to create a Google Doc, if you go to create a Notion page, if you go to create a presentation, an Excel doc, an email, first of all, it's you. And then you can control individually how you bring in people and you control the distribution. But with Confluence, and the way, this is the way the company uses Confluence, is it's open by default. You start working in there, you can collaborate with people, but as soon as you hit publish, it sends it out to the, you know, so to speak, like Confluence universe of your company, and there's no walls. So everything that's worked on at Atlassian is done in Confluence. It's very rare to find a restricted page. So all the work that everybody's working on is completely open to everyone. And you're constantly getting these notifications of things that are created and you can follow people and you can follow teams and you constantly see people from different teams. Just, you know, you publish a page, somebody from another team all of a sudden starts commenting on your page because they have full visibility. So it's radically open and it, the, the dog fooding in the culture is so much so that email isn't really a communication tool. If you need to chat with somebody, you'll use Slack. But otherwise, if you need to communicate your thoughts, you're gonna create a page in Confluence. If you need to make an announcement, you're going to write a blog in Confluence. 
And everybody's going to feel free to comment openly and say good things and not so good things. Obviously, things will be respectful, <laughs> but it's this very radical, open culture. And people will use the values within the, the discussion and conversation to call each other out in good and bad ways. But I think that's like an example. And then as opposed to just talking about the values, I think one of the things that, um, so if you think about this cycle, right? Like you have this set of values and then the product actually from the way it's built philosophically and its mechanisms actually live out aspects of the culture. And then the more people use it, the more it reinforces this actual sense of culture. You're, you're kind of, you have to come face to face with it, you know, all the time, every day. And you just get used to it. And then that actually goes back into the culture. So I've never really seen a cycle so strong between how these two things affect each other. And it creates something that's just different. And you also learn like the importance of um, dog fooding or somebody once told me, don't call it dog food, call it drinking your own champagne. Somebody who's European <laughs> uh, was a really good way of putting it. But nonetheless, everything's still called dog fooding. And really how important it is. And if you think about it, like go back to the culture, the reason everybody uses things in confluence. And by the way, being the product manager on the team that's changing the editor for a company of 5,000 people who are always using confluence, it's probably just as hard to change the editor for the company than it is to change it for the customers because everybody's so critical. Yes. So everything we did we had to think about the communication. We had to be ridiculously open and transparent and we couldn't bullshit our way through it. We had to be very honest. And like, in that sense, everybody was like, how do you find this balance within the culture of, we want to put our hands to the fire first. We want a dog food and we want to feel the pain because it protects customers. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to feel it. But at the same time, you're getting in the way of productivity of 5,000 people, right? Like you have the legal counsel they can't draft a document because your new editor has a bug that won't let them publish and they have a board meeting in five minutes. So it, it's these things that are very intentional and they create pressure pockets and they're, they just keep on going back to the culture and they put you in these positions where ultimately they're about making sure the customers get a great experience. They're about making sure that whatever uh, the, the philosophy was, is at Alassian's perspective, and I think it's one of the most beautiful um, aspirations, is that every company can work like a tech company. And when they do, they would be you know, more productive, more successful, and hopefully people would feel happier because uh, you know, like not a lot of companies are open and there's still like a lot of, or lack of psychological safety, so to speak, in the world, in the corporate world today. And um, this like intense, 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 dog fooding and openness and like saying like we have to use the product way more than you know customers wouldn't take it to the edge uh, really forces you also as a product person to think through how you build these things for yourself for your customers and how you try and build that culture into the company so it's not just trying to you know there's like um, the build faster horses like the, the ford saying that everybody uses yeah, yeah. instead of like building another collaboration product that does what every collaboration product does it's taking this different path with this you know it's funny you still don't see a lot of products that are like open by default it actually doesn't really exist except within Atlassian and saying like this thing will not change it's a constant because we think this is the key to helping other companies unlock their culture through the product that we deliver to them so the hope is that other companies as they use confluence some of what happens within Atlassian starts to rub off and you do that in different ways, right? Like you build a product and then you think about templates mm -hmm. and you think about like, how do we do things? What's worked for us? Because we work in a quite unique way. It's, it's an interesting balance. Yeah. There is so many um, things that you said that really resonates, but also bring up uh, more questions and more, yeah. uh, more things uh, to, to uh, you know, open up and, and discuss a bit more deeply. One of them is related to 
Well, let me see where I want to start, really, because there are so many things. But, but maybe the, the, the one of the last things that you said about this specific culture that Atlassian had and that culture was uh, really embedded within the, the the type of product that it developed to to help with the, the culture. I, I would think that that could be also something that might be a hard sell for them to do because like you said, most companies and most products are not open that way and people want to have control. They want to have this, uh, you know, either for many different reasons, even either because of their biases or uh, the way they were raised or the way they were mentored by their managers or whatever it is, they prefer to have uh, segregation of information and people um, as need to know basis and stuff like that. So how do you kind of rub, uh, you know, um, a company's culture to other companies by the product that, they, that you create? I, I, see, I see it could happen, but I also to see that it could be a very big challenge because if the other companies don't really understand why everything is open, they may not understand the product. Yeah, I think that's a super relevant question and point, which I don't think there's been... Obviously, like Atlassian is very well adopted and it does really, really well. I'll get into a second around like the the way the products are are sold and the philosophy behind that, which is fascinating as well, is first of all, you're right. Like it doesn't just happen everywhere. Like one of the most common things that you see with people is like it's hard to change people's mental models and it takes time and it takes a lot of trust. And I won't go into like Atlassian's like um, business strategy and stuff like that. But the point is, it's an uphill battle. And what you see often is uh, depending on the type of company, like either how advanced or like depending on their sector or, you know, how long they've been around and things like that. Companies that may be a little bit more private by default or for some reason, you know, they're they're, thinking about companies like Apple, right? Like by definition, they want to create partitions of information because they're working on, you know, certain parts of the organization literally can't know what another part of the company is working on. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's by design. So it's not uncommon to see people because when something's open by default and this also think about social media, right? Like social media is a open by default moment. You publish something, it's out there. And usually what a lot of people do is it's very similar is they'll craft their, their messy work somewhere. And if you think of somewhere, think of tools that you're using where it's private. And then once you get a couple eyes on it and you get a little bit of sign off and you go through your cycles of thinking it looks like crap and then, oh, it actually looks okay. And once you feel it's kind of ready and polished, you'll then bring it over as I'll call it a source of truth. Like, and on Confluence source of truth will be as it's the piece of information that people will go to look for in the organization, you know, as like the source of truth for knowledge. And what I mean when I say social platforms, the source of truth will basically be like, this is the thing that will live on the internet forever as like a source of, um, it's not going away unless you do like something that's ephemeral, of course. So I think that's, that's, it's always a challenge. And that's something that is kind of inherent to think about it as like why people are afraid to publish anything, whether it's in Confluence or online, but I'm kind of like going off on a tangent. (laughs) <laughs> There's something very interesting to talk about as far as like it relates to Atlassian, which is what I think makes it even trickier, but it's amazing because it works, is the, the company has a philosophy which uh, product managers are reminded of often, which is Atlassian's products do not get sold, they get bought. And the idea is to think about how do you build something that people can just pick up and start using. I like that. Yeah, they're probably the uh, most successful. I don't know if the most successful, but for B two B, maybe the first uh, biggest uh, product led uh, product, real product led product. Really, like you say, it's bought because it's it's a great product, not because there is a lot of salespeople that are pushing it. Yeah, and again, if you think about that, maybe it's not part of the values, but it's definitely part of the culture. And like, I can tell you, you know, like. There's a lot of customers and there's a lot of tiny customers and there's a lot of big customers. And as a product manager, like there could have been a scenario where like a huge customer would come along and say like, you know, this thing is missing as we were changing the editor. Now, every other company I worked at, if a big 
customer came along, what do you do? You stop everything, you get a tiger team and you build something for that customer because that's how a lot of SaaS product works. Mm -hmm. It was the first company where people looked at me and said, we don't do that stuff. We build for everyone. Like we build for all teams of all sizes from one user to a million users. And it's uh, liberating as a product manager. And it also forces you to think of like, uh, it's tricky, but it's, it's another aspect of how do you bring a philosophy into the product? And like every time, you know, it's so tempting to think about, you know, like we don't have the resources, the MVP will be like, we'll cut the scope. And usually what you end up resor- uh, resorting to is like, okay, I'll put a crutch here. I'll put a crutch here. But then you go back to this thing and you're saying the product needs to be bought. So it just has to stand on its own. So it makes you rethink things also, if you think about like design thinking and, and things like that. So I think at last is a very interesting case study and I'm going off on like mini tangents every time <laughs> because it's a B2B product with a consumer grade experience. So you, you live on like the intersection of these dimensions, which otherwise product managers don't live on. I like one of your original points where you speak to, you know, you're not only building it for a user, but you are a user. So that concept of you're experiencing it, you're living the experience of the product, you're building it as you would want to use it as a user. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, you have a much closer empathy to the users when you do that. Yeah. But it, but it does bring another question to me because I also had that philosophy from day one when I was doing software development that the more I will use the software that I'm developing, the better it will be. And sometimes we, you know, we used it only because of that philosophy, but we really kind of shoehorn it into a very misshapen uh, size of, of, of organization or use case, uh, because it wasn't really built for us. It was built for something a little, a little different. Uh, there was uh, some ways that we could use it. So, uh, you know, there was a software with the document management system. So document management is quite generic. So you can do a lot with document management. So we use that for document management, but the product was not designed for the type of product management that we needed. Uh, that was be- before, you know, Google Drive and before a lot of uh, the things that we have these, these days. Um, it was designed for product data management, CAD systems, very heavy on uh, bill of materials and, and stuff like that. So y- y- you could say that you were pretty lucky, you know, being able to do that, building products that are helping yourself as well. But most uh, product managers and most people are not uh, building something that they're also using it. Yeah. So, I mean, Matt, for you, probably the best place to be will be building uh, Power BI or software like Power BI because you love data so much and right. da- data analytics and stuff like that. Right. And, it, and even better will be a product management tool that does product analytics uh, because that will marry both things, you know, doing product management and doing data analytics. But, uh, you know, there is a very few companies like that. So how do you suggest to product managers then don't really... You, you know, need to use their products to, to actually, you know, get over that hurdle? Yeah, that's a great, great, great question. Um, and for what it's worth, Matt, that's why I went to work at Clicktail at the time. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, oh, so you worked at Clicktail. Oh, yeah, yeah that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, like that, that was the first time that happened to me where I was like, yes, mm-hmm. I use this thing. I want to be a product manager there. Right, um, right. Nice. Yeah, I think that's a really, really solid question. And I'll take a bit of a long route to answer it. So like there was something earlier that you were talking about, right? Is like, it's a double-edged sword when you build a product for people who are just like you as well. On one hand, you have tons of empathy. On the other hand, like there's a lot of responsibility, right? Like as product managers, like ultimately, I think I heard someone say this is like, we're there for like making good judgment calls. And I think if you're too close or if, you don't even notice like you're navel gazing, you may build something because you think it'll be great because you're, you lost the boundary between you as a PM and as a user. Um, so I think the two like interesting parallels, examples between if you think about Atlassian and LinkedIn, and this alludes a little bit also to like the, the actual question is, I think regardless of what product you're working on, and I'll give the two examples. So at Atlassian, the main thing that people use Confluence for is for uh, a knowledge base, right? They want to save information and 
um, they want it to be easy to find and um, it's important and like people leave companies, but they want the information to stay there as opposed to people walking around with information in their heads. It's, it's a big productivity suck. But if you think about like most companies or most product managers, when you're close to the product, it's easy for you to then imagine like, okay, we do this now, but as you start, you know, building out your principles or your culture, you start using it in not the way necessarily customers use it. Customers tend to use it functionally. And then as the company, you end up using uh, different products aspirationally. And the way Atlassian uses Confluence, if you think about it, is it's really there to break down silos. It's really there to create open companies where people feel like psychological safety. And it's meant to empower people to feel good about what they do, not just like the functional aspect, which is what, what people hire Confluence to do. And I think if you think of LinkedIn as well, there's like the story when LinkedIn started, it was a very successful job site. And um, my former VP of product at Atlassian, who used to be VP of product at the time at LinkedIn, was, would tell us there was this push and pull between we're doing so well as a job company, as a job site. And then there were people saying there's a potential around building a community for people around this. And it seems, it seems a little bit in the beginning like a diversion, but I think that's like the aspirational use of things. And I think if you think about it as like product managers working on products that they don't necessarily use. And like when I was working on this e-commerce product for like Amazon sellers, like I've never been an Amazon seller and I never actually bought, uh, so, sold anything on Amazon. I actually don't buy much on Amazon either, but that's a whole other story. I think one of the most important things to try and like reach that aspect is first of all, you need to have like an aspiration for where your product needs to go beyond like its functional use. It's very easy to get caught up in the whole, like what customers are asking for. And this is like a bit corny, but it's very hard for people to distill their feedback on what they want from something because they're usually just trying to use it and get on with their lives. So it's about mastering the art of like reading in between the lines and understanding the subtext of like where this thing could go. I think having a very strong set of principles, which ideally are long lived, but you're open to revisiting every so often. And Again, I think one of the things that a lot of companies who aren't in the situation, uh, from what I've seen, don't invest in is, you know, internal environments where people can just play around with things. Those are usually like business tries to grow, solve for a problem, and then it becomes, you know, like the opportunity cost to build something like a dog fooding environment just becomes pretty high because, you know, you can build another six features. But if there's one thing I think I've learned from, you know, being a product manager on the feed. I use the feed like a gazillion times a day, um, mm -hmm. even before I link, using, um, joined LinkedIn. And um, you know, Confluence was the same thing. I think the more companies invest in building these like dog fooding environments and really spend time up front, if you think about like boot camps or like 90 day onboarding experiences, the more you can get into the shoes of the customer or even you know back pre-COVID, um, the more you can spend time with the customer, um, even physically, like back in e-commerce, we used to travel to their warehouses and just spend full days with them. It really helps. And, you know, it's almost like when you want to teach kids how to play Monopoly, you give them, or adults, right? You give people fake money. Um, and then all of a sudden they feel the pain. And a lot of companies don't do that. So you end up kind of getting stuck in this theoretical state all the time. You know, all the knowledge, you talk to customers, you have the data, but you never actually you know, so to speak, got burnt and, and live felt the, it on your own skin. Live yeah. the pain. So, so it, it's not just about building a product that other people in your organization will use. It's really building a product that you would use yourself. And, yeah. and, and that, that is really an interesting concept because uh, even, uh, even if, uh, if I understand it correctly, even if it's not the actual main product that you're building, you know, to sell or, or for your clients to buy, um, it's still something that you will use to do your work and that will give you a better, I guess, um, empathy as a user, even, even if it has nothing to do really with the main product that you're building. Is that, yeah. is that what you, you were suggesting? I see, I see. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I just saw a post that somebody put up and like, um, think about people that work at TikTok. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean all of them use TikTok. Maybe some of them don't like TikTok. Mm -hmm. but and i'm not saying this is the best example it's just an example 
I think it could be a little controversial, but it's interesting is they actually encourage folks who are working on the product, including like engineers and all kinds to create uh, content on TikTok. And they actually set like a target for how many likes they get. So it's not just about, oh, go use the product and see how it works. They kind like, of force them to use it. They actually, it's not just about forcing. It's <laughs> the, the, the aspect of like getting X amount of likes means you really not just like go through the motions of what a customer goes through. You have to be a customer. <laughs> you have the same motivation all of a yeah, sudden. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so that's, that's I thought awesome. that was interesting. It's a, again, I think it's controversial and some people will say it's not cool, but I thought it was a very interesting example. Let me ask you a different question. Uh, last time that we chatted, you also told me that for at LinkedIn, you guys have some built-in tools in, in-house to do some of the product management, you know, because we're, we were exploring what type of products you might be able to talk with us on the podcast. But if those are built in house, then, you know, they're not commercially available. So it doesn't, it won't mean it to anyone really to listen to, to that. But um, that brings me to the point we're just talking about, uh, you know, company that invest in, in building in-house tools for, for yourself. And it's not necessarily those tools that, you know, LinkedIn will probably will never sell them, but they still saw the need to, to create them. And I, I, I'm not asking you to, you know, talk about those tools specifically, because again, it's not going to be relevant to, to our audience. But uh, more about, you know, the buy versus sell, uh, sorry, the buy versus build, yeah. where um, if there are commercial tools out there that can do these things, why should we go and develop them and spend the time and money to develop them? Um, so on one hand, yes, we, we, we're going to use them. So we will build this empathy on using them, but we're not um, necessarily a product company that build products for product people. We're, you know, a social media company for building jobs, um, you know, boards and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it, um, at LinkedIn specifically, right? Like it also depends like what type of products are built in-house versus not. Uh, these things were like definitely built before my time. So I, I don't have enough color on right. the decision-making aspect, but I think going back to your question and um, like also if you think about what it enables as far as... Um, thinking about like every company has their definition about what a good product manager looks like at the company. So what these tools help you do, like, so generally at LinkedIn, like a lot of companies of, you know, similar scale, you know, speed of decision is very important. Being mindful of scale is very important and being extremely mindful of the ecosystem or what I would call like the butterfly effect of every decision you make are probably like the most as important aspects you have. And a lot of third-party tools are trying to solve for, um, you know, like a breadth of customers. It's almost like their incentive as a product may sometimes not be aligned with the incentive of the company using it because they're trying to get to as many companies as possible. But I think when you have like this, uh, again, combination of like scale and um, unique information, for example, the data tools that we have in-house as product managers allow us to move it with an approach which is all about learning so like this concept of it's not really about like will it succeed or not succeed it's about what are we going to learn from it and we're constantly turning things on and off and it's okay and some things intentionally you turn on for like x amount of time to x percent of of, of customers and you turn it off because your only purpose is to learn something and the way these things are built solves for both depth and breadth. Um, essentially, what you're left with as a product manager is the ability to, out of the box, have measurements of exactly what you built, um, get a full picture of how what you built has impacted other areas of other products at a pretty incredible level. So it's like very well operationalized. And then you also understand scale. So in that moment, you're able to make a quick decision you're able to understand how it's going to scale and you're able to understand, you know, if we made some change uh, on the feed, maybe it impacted another product altogether. And those are things that are very important to the culture of being a product manager. And the ability to have those things operationalized and at your fingertips is invaluable. Mm -hmm. so, so it probably goes to the point that 
uh, there wasn't really any product out there that were able to give LinkedIn the ability to do that in that scale and with all the complexity of the different things that can be impacted. Yeah, cool. Hey, Avanon, I have a question about product analytics. It sounds like you have some experience with it in prior roles. So I being the, the data guy, I love analytics and data and how it can really impact a product and how it can improve the experience. I was wondering if you're able to speak to any of your experience with product and analytics. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I have a bit of a like an ongoing romance with uh, product analytics. So just to like, I'll, I'll try and like recap the different experiences. Um, the first company I worked at, Live Person, um, the reason I was able to like shift from an account manager to product was because me and a couple of guys built this like side project, um, you know, like in our spare time. And we called it analytics driven engagement and we got a patent for it. We packaged it and it was doing really well. And it was a really interesting experience where like we would take um, customers, Google analytics data, analyze it, and then like automatically create business rules to like proactively invite their customers on their websites to chat based, based on how they behave. Oh, wow. Um, that's cool. That's like where it started. And that was like the first um, fascination. Um, then I went on to Clicktail, uh, which... Um, is an in-page analytics company. It was acquired by Content Squared, I believe. There we were actually trying to think with something that never actually made it to market, but it was a really interesting, we were trying to solve a problem for product managers and people doing A-B testing, where we were trying to use things like scroll velocity and mouse coordinates to determine which elements on a page need to get tested and how. So you would get a page, you would basically provide a goal, right? The goal could be like something on the page. It could be a target downstream. And we would try and create this. We wanted to create this visual heat map of, you know, this button needs like cosmetic testing while another button, there's something wrong in the flow if you like go through it and something needs to be changed further down, but never saw the light of day. It was a super interesting project. And at the e-commerce company I worked at, so the product that I was the product manager for was called Revenue Intelligence. So it was all about building insights and dashboards for Amazon sellers. So they would know things like, you know, profit, profit margin, gross sales. Um, there was this whole thing about replenishment, which is like a whole world of its own and managing like how are sales going with inventory and there's multi-country and taking all these costs into, into play and building out like scouting reports so you can find the best products to buy and how much you should buy more of. And then if you bring it back to like at last thing on LinkedIn, it's more on the side of being a big consumer of these data products. So at Atlassian, um, there was an internal product. We used uh, Redash for a lot of like internal dashboards. And then there was a big adoption of like Amplitude where we would constantly, you know, build out different segments with different feature flags. And um, we would like isolate experiences and then we would do like these gradual rollouts and see how certain metrics would behave for different groups, either A, B tests, or if we would do like pre and post tests, but it's always been like a, a huge aspect of what we do, both on the quantitative and qualitative side. And I think LinkedIn by far is like the most uh, incredibly well operationalized company I've seen when it comes to being able to truly be uh, data-driven. It's probably the first place I've been at where you can approach a lot of things almost like a scientist and you can pose hypotheses. Mm -hmm. And because you have such a wonderful foundation and culture around knowing what's happening and, you know, like there's room for product intuition and principles and all those good things, but it's easy, a lot easier than any place I've ever been at to pose a hypothesis and go into it without having too much conviction or bias that like it's right or wrong, you go in and you know that you can fairly quickly get back a very detailed answer. And there's a culture around being able to analyze that in a very objective manner. And you can make very quick decisions and uh, understand like which areas you want to go down further and which areas to just say like, we don't need to invest in this, we can move on, mm -hmm. which is probably one of the biggest like productivity uh, enhancements I've seen as a product manager, because that's usually the area where, you know, it's very hard to get the right data. It takes a long time. You don't have the right events. You know, you don't have the right tools. So imagine just coming to an environment where everything is set up. It's almost like being a kid in a candy store. 
I think a lot of product managers are jealous right now hearing this. <laughs> me, inclu- me included. <laughs> I have a big smile on my face. You can't see it, but I, I'm smiling. I'm sure we can hear ear it. Ear to ear, ear to ear. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very cool. I think that's why, you know, like LinkedIn has set a lot of standards in across industries when it comes to these things. And you see, you know, similar size companies and peers who have like a, a similar um, approach or ability to do these things. And I, I think as a product manager, it's, uh, valuable to spend time on you know different parts of that spectrum same same way i think it's valuable to be a pm at a big company and at a tiny startup they're literally different roles like i think <laughs> things you have to think about and you know the the orders of problems of where you live and what you're trying to solve for are just completely different things and each one of them i think like just helps you become a, a well-rounded ultimately a well-rounded you know customer advocate like you just get to understand the customer from all these different lenses, whether you have a lot of great functions to work with or whether it's just you and another person and you're busy trying to do all this stuff. And I think data is a huge piece of that is like, how do you try and tell the story internally? How do you try and tell the story back to customers? And uh, I think each one of them has their pros and cons. Those are some great use cases. And Moshe and I are, are in a series right now where we're talking about in-app messaging and I think there's a really good opportunity there for, for analytics and being able to engage with your, with your customers and really gain some real, real positive insights from them through feedback and stuff like that. So that's a whole world. I can, there's something that I'm working on, which I, we can talk about in a couple of months, <laughs> uh, which is related to that. And I'd love to talk about that more, but yeah, like it, very different building it in an environment like at last year on LinkedIn. Then when I was at a startup, you know, I just got my boss's credit card, I paid for intercom, and within 10 minutes, you know, I had in-app messaging, and then I'd take Hotjar, and I'd use that, and I'd do a, a survey, I'd just try anything I could, but mm-hmm. very, very different. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and whenever this thing that you're working on is, is out and live, uh, we'll be happy to have you again. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I, I really have my wheel spinning right now. I'm thinking about all the different things we spoke about and it's really got me, got me brainstorming here. So uh, thank you so much for joining the show, having on. It's, it's really been insightful and really do appreciate you being on the show. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you again for having me and let me um, blabber on incoherently for as long as I have. Uh, yeah, it, it was perfect. Thank you so much, Avinam. And it, really, some of the things we discussed are uh, we can only get from people that are inside places like this that are really doing it uh, r- the right way, mm-hmm. both on the culture and on uh, how they build products. So that was really um, eye-opening. Thank you very much. And obviously, the best place mm-hmm. for people to reach you is LinkedIn, I suppose, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, we, yeah. We usually, we usually ask people that, but I'm assuming LinkedIn's the best. <laughs> I spent some time there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you every, might know every, one thing, one or two things about it. Every time I see posts, uh, people complaining about uh, LinkedIn, I, I uh, tag, uh, I mean, I'm just in case, so you will see it and send it to the right product manager. So <laughs> it always works. <laughs> it always works. Yeah. That's, that just shows that there really people at LinkedIn really uh, looking and listening to what uh, the users uh, want and, and what they're saying. So. Yeah. Just so you know, those, those mentions and comments are taken very seriously and they get shared very quickly with the right people. Perfect. Very cool. Well, thank you again. And um, to all the listeners, thank you so much for, for checking us out and uh, please give us feedback. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.